The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. Working with award-winning professors, Cronkite students learn news reporting, social media, shooting and editing videos, and producing content for communications industries. Cronkite's 15 professional programs give students the opportunity to cover critical issues throughout the U.S. and beyond. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh. Thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Thalahungva. Here are the headlines from Indian Country Today. The Indian Health Service is joining the other federal agencies in suspending the use of the Johnson & Johnson COVID-19 vaccine. This after six cases appeared in the U.S. of a rare type of blood clot in people who received the version of the vaccine. For now, the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines will be used instead of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Late Tuesday, the Gila River Indian community in Arizona also alerted its community the Johnson & Johnson vaccine will no longer be used. IHS says it does not expect this pause to affect its vaccination plan for Indian country. As we enter the second year of the coronavirus pandemic, tribes are getting help from a university to continue protecting people from COVID. Correspondent Karina Dominguez explains how this resource is helping spread the word and not the virus. This animation shows just how quickly the virus can spread. Johns Hopkins University created these resources aimed at tribal members. The university's Center for American Indian Health has videos and public service announcements to share information about the pandemic. Animations and infographics are helping the center get the message across that family and cultural gatherings are still considered high risk. Beverly Gorman is featured in one video. She's a Navajo traditional healer and encourages everyone to get their COVID-19 vaccine as soon as possible. I want us to stop the spread of the COVID-19 and to protect our precious people. The website's biggest focus is on the importance of getting vaccinated. Many people have questions about the virus and the vaccine. I know I did, but talking with my health provider, I know the vaccine will stop us from becoming very ill with COVID-19. Scripts are also available for tribal radio stations to use, as well as fact sheets for community members. The Johns Hopkins Center for American Indian Health says the goal is to provide scientifically accurate and accessible materials. In Phoenix, Karina Dominguez, Indian Country Today. We partnered with Johns Hopkins during this pandemic to create a more comprehensive database on COVID-19 cases. So far, data has been collected from more than 70 tribes. Well, the country's oldest marathon is being asked to change its date by a group of Native Americans. The Boston Marathon is typically held in April, but due to the pandemic, organizers moved it to October 11th. However, that date conflicts with Indigenous Peoples Day in the town of Newton. The 26.2-mile course goes through the small town, which just passed this holiday in November. Chalina Rudonas is the leader of the local committee. She says the town did not consult with them about the race date and they learned about the day change on social media. She says this isn't just a side holiday, but a real holiday they want to celebrate. The indigenous peoples of this land care, the indigenous peoples land you're running on, we care. And this is a time for us to commemorate it's a time for celebration in honor of the victory. And then it's also, it's also a time for mourning to remember those indigenous peoples in the past. And with my tribe in particular, that change from Christopher Columbus Day was everything to my people because he never stepped foot here in North America. We also reached out to Wayne Sikekwaptiwa. He's Hopi, and this will be his sixth year running the Boston Marathon. He says there has to be a better solution. One day, 
doesn't define you being native, you know. It's something you you live with, you learn about every day, you you pray every day, you carry out these teachings that your grandparents, your uncles, your aunts, they everything that's instilled in you, it's supposed to be day to day. We also reached out to Mayor Ruth Ann Fuller, who sent us this statement. While the pandemic has made so many things more complicated, we are excited to celebrate both Indigenous Peoples Day and the Boston Marathon in Newton on October 11, 2021. Newton, which has the longest stretch of the marathon course, will require a lot of City of Newton staffing, so it will be both fun and safe. On the same day, we are providing a large and safe location on a field at Newton South High School for an Indigenous Peoples Day celebration in Newton. However, Donez says the spot being provided is not accessible and does not have the space to meet their needs. They still hope to meet with the mayor. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Tholohungva. When we come back, who has the right to receive the $8 billion in the CARES Act? Nathan McCowan will join us to explain the perspective from the Alaska Native Corporations as a case is being heard in the U.S. Supreme Court. Just what constitutes a tribe? Well, the United States Supreme Court heard a case in January that was about that very issue on who gets a share of $8 billion identified in the federal coronavirus relief called the CARES Act. The lower courts were split on whether Alaska Native corporations, which own much of, most of Alaska's native land in a 1971 settlement, should be in the mix. However, the U.S. Treasury Department reviewed from the high court after a federal appeals court, which ruled in September, that corporations aren't eligible. Confused? Well, we reached out to both sides of this case to get to the why. Earlier this week, we told you from the Alaska Native Corporation, the opposing side. And at that point, the Native Corporations declined, but they ended up reaching back out to us and decided to come on and tell their side of the story. Welcome, Nathan McCowan. Thank you, Mark. Uh, pleasure to be here with you. Uh, good morning, and I uh, hope all is well with you. So that introduction itself was confusing, but the issue is confusing. Maybe outlining what you think is, is, is at stake. Sure, it's, it's uh, you know, Alaska is the exception in many, many ways. And the Alaska Native paradigm that exists up here uh, is no less exceptional. Um, Alaska Natives uh, have two sets of institutions uh, that uh, are paramount in our lives. We have tribes, uh, sovereign entities, and we also have Alaska Native corporations. Uh, the Alaska Native Corporations are a unique uh, set of institutions, um, and they arise from the Alaska Native's unique experience and unique history uh, of contact with uh, the United States of America, uh, the role of United States uh, Indian policy, treaty making, uh, um, and self-determination era, etc. Um, and so the Alaska Native Corporations and the tribes both play key roles in helping Alaska Natives uh, to prosper, uh, to pro have, provide services, uh, and to ensure uh, their, their economic, social, and cultural vitality. Is there a formula that would be fair to both tribes in Alaska and the corporations? I think that, that the, the fairest formula um, has to take into account uh, the totality of the uh, Alaska Natives' uh, institutional uh, footprints. Um, ignoring one um, cuts off uh, a, a large chunk of the other. Um, there's been some that have, that have uh, made the claim that um, Alaska Natives somehow double dip uh, because uh, we have corporations and tribes, uh, which is an appealing argument. Um, it, there, it strikes a basic sense of fairness. The challenge with that argument is that um, we, we, it re relies on the, on the assumption that the size of the scoops are exactly the same. Alaska Native scoops are half the size, and in some cases less than half the size of uh, comparable tribes in the United States. So we have to have two, two scoops uh, in order to uh, even begin to reach uh, a fair and equitable um, uh, allocation of resources. I, I remember in 1971, uh, Tommy Richards was covering 
the ANCSA debate in Congress, and he actually wrote that ANCSA was a termination bill. Is this kind of the fruition of that, where one side see this as a termination of tribal rights? I don't think that's the case at all. Um, I think that uh, tribal sovereignty has never been stronger in, in Alaska. Um, I think that our tribes um, are healthy and, and um, we want to see them prosper to an even um, more significant degree. Um, ANCSA is unique in that it straddles the, the, it was an act that passed that straddled two eras in, uh, in American Indian policy, the termination era, um, and it was before the self-determination era. And so it has components of both in the sense that reservations at the time that ANCSA passed were not seen to be uh, an effective way of uh, propagating the best interests of Indians. Um, the, the Bureau of Indian Affairs in the, in the 50s and 60s leading up to the passage of ANCSA was a fairly heavy handed um, 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 entity, uh, very, very uh, pa uh, patronizing in some ways to, to Alaska Natives and we wanted to be able to decide for ourselves. So I would actually flip it on its head and say that, that um, we're not looking at termination at all. We're actually looking at the pinnacle of self-determination. We have Alaska Natives deciding for ourselves that we want to be able to control our lands uh, via the, the, uh, the corporations. We want to control our economic destinies via the corporations. We want to have our services provi uh, provided through both. One of the issues in this debate was the role of government versus corporations. Um, Many of the corporations take on unique aspects of government, whether it be fire suppression or other aspects. Maybe talk about that a bit. Sure. You know, the, the reality when, when ANCSA was passed uh, and the land was, was conveyed to these new things called corporations, Congress recognized through its plenary uh, authority that, uh, that these corporations were going to be endowed with uh, specific responsibilities um, and that they were not going to be similar to, to other corporations. Um, you know, it's a bit of a, a, a problem of, of term of art to call them corporations. Uh, you know, the, the people focus on the corporation as opposed to Alaska Native. So today what we have are corporations who provide a litany of services um, um, to their members, many of whom don't have access uh, to the services that come uh, through the tribes themselves. So everything from housing assistance to elder assistance to scholarships. Uh, during the pandemic, the corporations have been involved in ensuring food security, temporary housing, um, uh, uh, um, COVID preparation, um, um, you know, emergency housing, uh, the whole, whole, whole spectrum of, of things that they take on uh, in emergency situations like what we've been experiencing over the last 12 months and as a, a rudimentary, uh, ordinary course of business. One of the challenges uh, for the tribal governments in Alaska is just sheer size. Some of them are basically one person operations and to have to deal with the mechanics of a distribution of this sort of uh, fund was a challenge in its own right. Yeah, many, many of the, you know, many of the tribes um, 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 still, still need to have their capacities be bolstered. Um, and the ANCs have been working arm in arm with them to bolster that capacity. Um, my own corporation that I, that I run on a day-to-day -day basis has been working quite closely with the tribe of our community uh, to ensure that there is, uh, you know, as administratively seamless of, uh, of a, 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 a distribution of the first CARES Act funds. Um, we're there arm in arm with them uh, to benefit uh, all of our people. In, in a way, has the argument shifted with the second uh, coronavirus relief fund? Um, I don't think it's shifted so much as it just demonstrates Congress's ability to uh, clearly decide when they want to have Alaska Native corporations uh, be a part of relief and, and when they want to utilize uh, uh, simply the tribes. Um, I think that it, it, if anything, it strengthens the argument that Congress very much intended for the ANCs to be a part of the CARES Act. Um, and, uh, uh, but the reality on the ground is regardless of whether or not we're, we're receiving funds uh, via the allocations of Congress, Alaska Native corporations still retain a, a mandate by Congress to, pro to care for the social, economic, and cultural well-being of, uh, of our people. Uh, and that mandate uh, is irregardless of any sort of funding stream. Were the Alaska Native corporations able to take advantage of other uh, mechanisms in coronavirus relief legislation? Sure, uh, tribes were as well. Um, both tribes right. and corporations were able to apply for, uh, apply for and receive uh, PPP loans. 
Uh, there's other other benefits that tribes were able to receive uh, exclusively, other benefits that corporations were able to exclusively. There is a host of needs that were created by COVID. There's a host of needs that remain uh, uh, and will continue for years and years. And so this is not really an issue of uh, one getting something that the other didn't. Everybody is shortchanged in terms of resources. Um, I, I don't think that the the uh, the American Relief Plan Act is going to be the end of it. There are widespread needs across Indian Country uh, in the contiguous United States. There are widespread needs across Alaska Native communities, uh, and uh, we we need to be working together to ensure that those needs, on a continual basis, uh, are being properly funded. Has this whole debate damaged the relationship between tribes and? Um broader Alaska Natives, but also corporations? I mean, I think that it's it's been a challenging time for everybody. Um, you know, that uh, COVID has has laid bare uh, the the inequalities that exist across, uh, across Indian country, across Alaska, across the contiguous United States. Um, and people have been um, ha working and reasoning uh, from a state of stress. And so, you know, we look forward to, um, you know, the continued vaccinations uh, occurring, which are, which are happening at a, at a very high rate across uh, the reservation system. Uh, they're happening at a very high rate amongst the Alaska Native population in Alaska. We look forward to the day where we can meet arm in arm with our uh, indigenous cousins and, uh, and work uh, collectively for our, our, our best interests. In fact, you mentioned um, the nonprofit sector, which really is a, a kind of the ultimate self-determination because, uh, for example, in Alaska, all of the Indian health system is basically run by tribes through nonprofit corporations. And that really came out of the corporate system as well. Yeah, so we, we, have a, we have a very, I mean, again, we have a unique system. I hate to, I hate to uh, beat that word, that word into the ground, but we have a unique system. We don't have a single uh, IHS employee in the state of Alaska. And that's a result of the tribes, but also the corporations um, ability to uh, receive funds and pool those funds into uh, uh, the large healthcare system that we have. And um, around the world it's recognized as one of the best. It's not that it's, it was something different, it was something better. I think you could argue. No, they're, they've been they've been extremely efficient in the just in the deployment of the vaccines. Um, you know, we were we were uh, uh, we have, we're seeing some of the highest rates of vaccination uh, across the country, and in the large part is due to the efficiency that's caused by um, uh, 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 the, the the scale, the scope, the professionalism um, of of our of our regional nonprofits um, and our and um, ANTHC, which is the the collectivizing uh, uh, entity. We have less than a minute left, but what's your hope for um, the outcome in all of this? I hope is that that uh, the the recognition continues to 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 be there that uh, uh, the Alaska Natives' way of life uh, revolves around both sets of our institutions, both our tribes as well as our Alaska Native corporations, and that uh, the the uh, Congress uh, continues to to realize that Alaska has an exceptional uh, history, uh, and that we can uh, come together with our uh, um, Indigenous brethren uh, to to fight for uh, the the collective needs that we all have. Thank you so much, Nathan McCowan, for joining us today. Uh, thank you. I appreciate it. When we come back, we'll check in with John Tusuda on policies taking shape in the nation's capital. John Tusuda III is a regular contributor to Indian Country today. He has an extensive political background. In 2002, he worked as staff director for the Senate Indian Affairs Committee and he's a former Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary for Indian Affairs. He served in that position from 2017 to 2020. Prior to that, he worked with Navigators Global, which is a company which provides political services to several industries, including tribes. John Tasuda joins us to talk today about policy and its impact on Indian country. Welcome, John. Thank you, Mark. It's glad to be back uh, visiting with you. I know last time we talked about infrastructure, but I wanted to talk to you about it again because we left a lot unsaid. And since two weeks have happened, uh, there's been now growing opposition from Republicans to this uh, infrastructure plan. And I wanted to help have you explain to us the differences, why people think differently on infrastructure. 
Um, sure. And, uh, you know, infrastructure is a, is a, uh, not just a hot topic now, but it's been something that's chronically underfunded in our country in general and in, and in Indian country specific. Uh, as you, as you kind of alluded to though, the question of what qualifies as infrastructure is always a debate and really, you know, sort of top of the, top of the uh, discussion right now and, and, you know, highlights the differences in views. Um, so I, I would say uh, first thing, you know, when we have uh, a, a large package and, and uh, in DC parlance, you know, they call it a train, right? Everybody, they talk about people trying to hitch a ride on a train. So this infrastructure legislation that you know, they're debating that the president's proposed, you know, is viewed as something that will very likely pass in some form. And so uh, the, the usual uh, sort of uh, smaller politics that play around these things is going on now as, as uh, members have uh, what they consider pet projects that might fit within shoehorn into uh, quote infrastructure and trying to get them on this train. Um, but when you, you step back and you look at the larger picture, um, you know, there is probably, uh, you know, vast agreement on what, what most of us think is infrastructure. So roads, bridges, uh, you know, uh, in Indian country, you know, schools, hospitals, um, you know, all of those things uh, have been underfunded for years and, and, you know, desperately need and could, you know, really move us uh, years ahead if we got a big shot. Uh, of uh, resources into to fixing and, and to updating that, that infrastructure. Uh, what happens again, you know, as, as folks look at something that is uh, a large piece of legislation moving forward, that's gonna have a lot of funding with it. They try to shoehorn other things in. And so, uh, you know, one, one part of that is looking at, uh, you know, President Biden proposing to put things like uh, senior healthcare into that. And um, certainly, you know, if you think about healthcare broadly and the infrastructure needed to deliver it, you know, it's not, you can look at it as not just sort of hard infrastructure, bricks and mortar, et cetera, but, you know, sort of the, the infrastructure to deliver the service. And, and I think that's how uh, some folks, including the president, are wanting to look at some things like the, you know, that, that particular piece of the legislation, senior healthcare. Um, but Republicans often focus on, uh, you know, sort of hardcore uh, infrastructure or traditional infrastructure, if you want to call it that. Um, and so, you know, they, they have, uh, they're having a lot of discussion about, you know, what will be able to be squeezed into that definition. And that, of course, affects the bottom line, the budget impact of this legislation. And that's something else that uh, Republicans, um, you know, often like to have uh, large legislation broken up into its component parts, so they can figure out how much it costs. Uh, they, you know, they, they often focus on what will be the budget impact in years to come for any legislation that passes and you know infrastructure is one they're often willing to spend the money on for hard infrastructure uh, even if it's really big because they see that as an investment in the future but they want it broken out to see how that investment you know is going to pay off in years to come it's harder when you turn to something that's not regular infrastructure or old school infrastructure something like you know a healthcare in a uh, delivery system infrastructure so that's where they get kind of hung up, I think. And uh, that, that's an active part of the debate right now. You know, it's interesting. A lot of state governments and tribal governments, for that matter, have different budgets for capital projects as opposed to ongoing budgets, whereas in Washington, it's all lumped together. And, and that actually complicates it when you're trying to figure out how much it costs. Yes. Well, you know, so again, sort of in, in a D.C., uh, centric world, um, it's both complicating, but also sometimes uh, greases the skids. And so when you don't have to, you know, sort of pitch things into, um, you know, different buckets, um, then you can kind of fudge the lines. And that sometimes help them, helps, uh, you know, congressmen, senators to, uh, you know, get over the hump, so to speak, in, in reaching a deal. And so uh, while they, you know, let's say a, a Republican senator may have preferred to have everything neatly, you know, dropped into different buckets, um, it's important enough to him maybe to get some of the buckets done that he's willing to fudge a little bit on the others. Um, and, you know, they can kind of do that since, as you said, they don't have this bright line between sort of capital and, and other things in a budget like other governments do. One of the dividing lines in Indian country is uh, Davis-Bacon and the idea of a prevailing wage. Uh, it makes projects more expensive on one hand and on the other, it's good for the workers. 
how is that viewed in, in Washington? It's been a hot topic of debate in any country for a number of years as well. And uh, there's sort of, uh, you know, two ends of the rope here. And sometimes they come together and, and, uh, and they work and sometimes they don't. Uh, you know, one end is uh, from the tribal government perspective and, and even from the federal government as it provides funding for, for projects, uh, et cetera. Um, you know, you're looking at the overall budget. How much can we get done with the amount of dollars that we have allocated for this? And, uh, you know, oftentimes, and if we're you know, staying on the subject of infrastructure, uh, you know, uh, the, the wages and, and uh, hiring folks to do the work, you know, is a significant part of the budget on that. And so it impacts Indian country because oftentimes, you know, we're very, we're in very rural locations and um, you know, the prevailing wage is usually lifted from sort of the closest urban area. And those wages may be significantly higher than, than the wages, you know, on the reservation or, or around there. And so, um, you know, if you import that sort of urban uh, level of pay to the rural location of a tribe, that, that can impact how much money is available to complete a project. Thank you so much. It's always fascinating. Thank you, Mark. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. Thank you for watching. We will be back with another edition tomorrow. I'm Mark Trahan. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run Indian Country Today is produced at the Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communications at Arizona State University. This is Indian Country Today.